Hi, this video starts a new topic in my project to design an FPU using Verilog. It's often useful to convert an integer value to a floating point value. The MIPS architecture has a number of instructions for converting integer values to floating point values. It's common for other machine architectures to have similar instructions. Even though I'm referencing a specific instruction for a specific architecture, this functionality isn't specific to the MIPS architecture. And this functionality is required per section 5.4.1 of the IEEE 754 standard. The CVT DW instruction converts a 32-bit signed integer to a 64-bit floating point number in the IEEE 754 binary 64 format. I'm starting with this instruction because 32-bit signed integers can be represented exactly using the binary 64 format. No rounding of the result is required. Remember, my rule is to start with something simple that works and then add functionality as needed. Let's review the fields of the binary 64 format. This format has a sign bit, an 11-bit exponent field, and finally, a 52-bit significant field. Remember that for normal numbers, the significant field is effectively 53 bits wide because we have an implied leading 1-bit. All of the 32-bit signed integer values will be converted into either a binary 64 positive 0 value or a normal number we can quickly see that a 32-bit integer will easily fit without rounding into a 53-bit significant value. Like when I created the FP class module, I'm going to use System Verilog rather than Verilog. Again, this is because I need the System Verilog function $clog2. Verilog doesn't have this function. Much of the code in this video is a repeat of the work that was done for the FP class module. I'm repeating it here so that this video will be self-contained. That is, it won't be dependent on information from other videos in this series. This module has one input, a 32-bit signed integer, and one output, the binary 64 version of the integer input value. Here you can see that I use parameters to specify the size of the integer input value and the size of the subfields of the binary 64 output. And here I use those parameters to declare the actual input-output arguments. The SIG register value is my working space where I process the integer input to create the significant value. And the mask value is used to examine the leading bits of the current SIG value. The value i is the iteration variable for the loop which follows. The exp value keeps track of how many bits the SIG field was shifted to the left. More on this in the following slides. The code in this slide shows several different operations. It starts by loading the integer input value into the SIG working space. Negative integers are stored in 2's complement form. 2's complement form isn't useful for floating point numbers. Instead, floating point numbers are stored as sign and magnitude values. The n integer value needs to be tested for being a negative number. If the input integer is negative, we need to take its absolute value. Don't worry, we will eventually use the signed data to create our binary 64 output, but not yet. Now we test to see if the input value is 0. If so, we construct positive 0 as our output value, and we're done. Now we're left with the case that the input value is non-zero. We need to move the most significant one bit into the most significant bit of sig. Here is where our loop comes in. I use similar logic in the FP class module to normalize the significance of subnormal numbers. A link for that discussion should be appearing on your screen now. The first iteration through the loop, we test to see if the 16 most significant bits of SIG are all zero. 
If they are, we shift the value in SIG left 16 places and we increment EXP by 16. The code doesn't explicitly use the number 16. The value 16 is computed from C log 2 underscore int n. And in turn, C log 2 int n was computed from the number of bits in our integer input value. The value 16 is used to initialize the loop variable i. For each loop iteration, the value in i will be halved. So, for the second time through the loop, i will be 8. This continues through to when i is 1 for the last iteration of the loop. When we exit the loop, the most significant bit of sig will be 1, and exp holds the number of places we needed to shift sig to the left to get the most significant 1 bit into the most significant bit of sig. That is, exp holds the number of bits we needed to shift the significand in order to normalize the significand. It's time to compute our final exponent value. The 32-bit signed integer value, which has the largest magnitude, is negative 2 raised to the 31st power. Note that this exponent is one less than the number of bits in our integer input. That's where the value int n minus 1 comes from when we compute the final exponent value. To that value, we add the exponent bias value. As a reminder, the IEEE 754 formats use an unsigned exponent field, so we need to add a bias value so that negative exponents can be represented by positive values. Then we subtract the value stored in EXP to adjust our exponent value for each place we shifted the value SIG to the left. To get our final output value, we concatenate the sign bit from the integer input value with the adjusted exponent value and the SIG field. Remember to strip the leading one off of the SIG field. The leading one digit is implied for normal numbers. And finally, remember to zero pad the remaining bits of the significant field. Now that we've seen how to convert 32-bit signed integers into a binary 64 result, it should be trivial to modify the code to convert 64-bit integers into binary 128 values, 16-bit integers into binary 32 values, and 8-bit integers into binary 16 values. You should even be able to modify the code to convert unsigned integer values to their larger corresponding floating point values. As an exercise, I would encourage you to modify the code so it's capable of converting unsigned integers to floating point values. The description for this video has the address of the GitHub repository for this code. In the next video, I will be converting a 32-bit signed integer into a binary 32 value. This will finally take us into the topic of how to round our floating point results. Please share this video with friends and colleagues which might have an interest in this video series. Questions and comments are welcome in the comments section. If you found this video useful, please click like below. While you're at it, subscribe to the channel, then click the bell to be notified when new videos are available. Thanks!